Can I have the roll call, Robert? Sure. Uh, Chair Chair Key. Here. Um, <clears throat> Vice Chair Malbec. Here. Uh, Jack Ringham. Here. Greg Conlon has not joined yet. Paul Jones has not joined yet. Jim Jans has not joined yet. And then we have Jim Massey. Okay. Let's uh, Jim, move you on. want to acknowledge? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. And it looks like we have Paul joining in now. Okay, great. All right. Is our new council member liaison uh, Bob Polito? Uh, that is her? correct. I thought it was Diane. Uh, she was. Um, alter she's alternate now. Oh, okay. And we'll get a new one next year because uh, Bob's just serving out the term of uh, our previous council member. So, hey, okay. you you should be done with me in November. <laughs> Okay, so I just want to confirm, does everybody have the agenda on their screen? Yeah, I can see yeah. your screen. Yes. Great. Uh, looks like we have Jim Jans joining now as well. Okay. Um, why don't we move on to public comments? Uh, are there any public comments? I don't see any members of the public on the line. Okay. And I did not receive any public comments in advance of the meeting. Okay, uh, so let's move on to item three, uh, approval of minutes. Are there any, uh, excuse me? I was gonna say, so recommend approval. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, first I'd like to, uh, um, we have a motion to approve, but I'd like to ask if there's anyone that has amendments or uh, changes that they'd like to see in the uh, February 1st minutes. No, I thought they looked good. Okay. Seeing none, do I have a second for the motion to approve? I'll second. Okay. Paul has seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any no's or abstentions? None noted. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, no presentations. And then so we'll move on to the uh, regular agenda. So the first item is the uh, draft 2022 High Speed Rail Authority Business Plan. Uh, Robert, can you introduce the item? Uh, sure. Um, thank you, uh, Chair, members of the committee. Um, as noted in our previous meeting, High Speed Rail has issued its uh, business plan, draft business plan for 2021. Uh, it's released currently for public comment. Public comment is due on April 11th. And uh, I'm gonna thank uh, the members of the committee that have provided uh, comments to staff. Um, I took those and compiled the, the draft comment letter um, seeking input and approval to move forward with a recommendation to council uh, to submit uh, the public comment letter um, to the High Speed Rail Authority. Um, and so this is an action item and uh, fully open to receiving comments, edits. I did get an email from our vice chair with a few um, edits for consideration and I can let him go through those. But what I'd like to do is at the end of, the, at the end of this item, have either a recommendation to move uh, the letter as amended by the committee or delegated down to um, either staff or a subcommittee to finalize the letter. Uh, the intent is to get it onto the council's agenda at their April 6th meeting so that the letter can get uh, sent out to the authority in time. And so right now, hopefully on your screen, you have the, uh, the draft letter. Yep, I see it. Um, perhaps we, uh, we should go through John's edits first, or, uh, did you just want to describe them broadly and then if, if they're um, small? Sure, I can do that. So the first comment, I mean, is really related to, um, uh, 
spelling out uh, Transbay Terminal the first time that we used the um, TBT abbreviation. Um, he had a comment with regards to the asterisks that I had put into the letter on uh, the timelines. And uh, I can either note it as estimated. I, I pulled the, these numbers from uh, partially from one of the comments that, that I got from one of the rail committee members, but I couldn't find all of the the times and distances. And so the ones with the asterisks, uh, ast asterisks are, um, I'm going to say estimated. Or pa Paul might have something to say about that. Uh, Paul. Yes, I was going to suggest 125 miles for the Fresno to Bakersfield. Uh, it's there. Oh, okay. oh yeah, so it is. <laughs> uh, for it. Since I couldn't find it in the actual document, that's why it has the asterisks on it. Why not? Well, it, it, it wasn't. The asterisk. I, I took that from earlier work. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I don't think, I also look for some of these numbers and I couldn't find them in the document either. I don't think it's completely, um, it's, it's all there. Maybe hmm. they just skipped those. One thing I did note was um, I think the Bakersfield to Palmdale is 79 miles, not uh, 70. Okay. Is that, is that in there? Is that, I thought yeah, I it's on. Uh, let me tell you the page number. Hold on. I got to find my browser. Okay. There we go. It's on page it even worse. 42. They have that big graphic on page 42. Um, Okay. All right, so I can correct that to 79. I'll put uh, underneath, I'll put an asterisk and just say estimated. Okay. Yeah, I think if you just say what the asterisk mean, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with the asterisk. It's just that I couldn't find what they meant. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, the other two comments were near the tail end on page four. Um, deletion of the, call it the second paragraph right before funding. Um, and uh, comment about a run on sent maybe a, a slightly long sentence in the last paragraph. And so what I'll do is I'll go back to the beginning of the document and uh, go ahead and seek input from, from the committee as to basically either paragraph by paragraph or page by page um, so that we can get through this in a timely manner. Okay. Um, so are there any comments on the first page? Uh, yes. I have a comment. Yeah, yes, good. Go ahead, Jack. It says the uh, plan states that the travel time will be two hours and 40 minutes. I think that's out of date. I think later on, we have something that says it's going to be 188 minutes, which is three hours and eight minutes. That's our they estimate based increasing. on the information. <clears throat> The 308 is the sum of the individual segment times. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, the two hours and 40 minutes, Jack, is to come to uh, uh, required in Proposition 1A, and that's what they have said here. They're, they're going to meet all the requirements of Proposition 1A. So that is, in effect, a declaration of that time. Well, if they say it's uh, 188 minutes, they're saying they're not going to meet that requirement. Well, that's sort of what we're telling them. <laughs> okay. And so that uh, just to enumerate that on the um, the first line on the second page. In reviewing the individual segment travel times, it appears that the total travel time would be closer to three hours and eight minutes. 
versus the two hours and 40 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, are there any, were there any other comments on that first page before we move on to the second page? Seeing none, let's move on to the second page. Okay, so on the second page, uh, I have your noted correction of 79 miles from Bakersfield to Palmdale and the um, putting down the asterisks is estimated. If you change the distance to 79 miles, then you're going to have to recalculate the required average speed down there in paragraph number two. Average speed. Well, you say 23 minutes would require an average speed of 206. I assume that was calculated on 70. Uh, but now you're calling it 79, so that must go up to. Okay. I think, Paul, I think that calculation was from you, if I'm yeah. not. Okay. Well, if it's uh, 79 miles. In uh, tw uh, 23 minutes, that's well, that's 206 miles an hour. You've got the right number there, then. Okay, so we'll just correct it to 79. And yeah. so, yeah, it'll be okay. It's okay, it, it was the 70 that was wrong, not the 206. It was the 70 that was wrong, not the 70. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, and then I think the other comment on this page was capitalization on the Census Bureau. Okay. Any comments on this page? If none, I guess we can move to page three. I think page three is good. It seems to capture all the information about the capital costs. Was this the page with the uh, deleted uh, paragraph that uh, no, John that, recommended? No, that's the next page. Next. Oh, this next page, okay. Just wanted to know what, what it was that we're, we're taking yeah. out, that's all. I think it's a nice touch to quote their Northern California Regional direct Director <laughs> as contradicting what they say in the, uh, in the, in the plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not gonna take credit for interviewing them. These are from newspaper articles that are referenced down below. Even so, good catch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, any additional feedback on this page? Nope, and then let's move on to the next page. Oh yeah, one, one more in the second, under capital costs in the uh, fifth line up, you say projects area where the authority does not have the experience. I think areas is unnecessary there. Okay, so hold on, let me just, uh, where are we at? Uh, two, four, it's the sixth line up from the end of the second paragraph, second word in. I'm not uh, so. From the bottom of the page, sixth line up or? No, he said the second. It's the uh, second paragraph. No, it's, it's the first paragraph. Oh, first paragraph. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So first paragraph. Wait a minute. Projects area. It, uh, it's in the it's in the maybe cap that's, label capital costs, and it's about eight or nine lines down from the start. Okay. Oh yes, there it is. Uh, many major projects area where oh, the okay. Oh, okay. area doesn't seem to fit there. Okay. So there are many major project. It, Okay, hmm. the was where the authority is. Okay. And so I can either, so 
So if that's okay, I will take the S from uh, projects comment. and move it to areas. Okay. And then Jack has a comment after that. Yes, Jack. I'm going to comment on the uh, bus increasing from 68 billion to 105. It says it's due mainly to steadily increasing experience on the different segments. I think the major portion of it is inflation. I don't know if we're expressing these in current year dollars or what year dollars, but. They are listed in the plan as being expressed in year of expenditure dollars, but those are subject to inflation too, as you make the estimate in succeeding years. <laughs> so I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm... I'm going to say that as they have gone through their project, costs have increased on a number of things. And, mean, and the intent of the statement is that, for lack of a better way to put it, they're learning as they go. And they are steadily increasing the costs based on what they are learning. And so I think that they've even indicated that they have changed their management and oversight structure, uh, particularly related to right of way and other things based on their experience. And that has, in, that has, as they did that in terms of trying to get a handle on it, the costs did go up uh, substan substantially. And I think that even given the quote down below as they, um, as you go through the discussion of the tunnel, um, you know, the, the cost of that went up by 40%. And so as they're going along, they're gaining experience, but the costs are going up. Um, I don't think we want to defend why the costs are going up. I think it's more just enumerating the fact that they estimated a $69, $68 billion project back in 2012, and now it's already 105 billion. And I think we all expect that in 2026, a couple of business plans from now, it's gonna be substantially higher. Yeah, I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, uh, any other comments on this page? Okay, seeing none, why don't we move on to page four? Okay, and so this, oops, slid up a little too far. Um, and so the recommendation was to delete the statement about it's our belief that as with all large capital projects, the cost will continue to grow. Um, Oops, I just had oh, Greg's in the waiting room. Uh, I apologize. Let me let Greg in. Okay. As we were talking, I I missed the fact that he was uh, joining. So Greg, I apologize. So the comment is to delete that uh, that statement there. It makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm the guy that suggested deleting it, and I just think it's a very weak sentence. I mean, I don't think they care what we believe, and I we've established no basis for the 150 to 200 billion. It's just a swag at this point. I mean, it's probably yeah. realistic, but I, I have no objection to deleting or any other edits that uh, the committee is interested in. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm fine with deleting it as well. It makes sense. So. Okay. Um, and so as we move through, I'll leave the last paragraph, um, the summary for uh, further discussion. And John, you can enumerate the comments that, that you had and uh, we can work on 
what the committee would like to see is the closing statements. Um, Go ahead, Paul. I, I'd like to raise an, an item that uh, sort of got lost in time. A lady from Southern California by the name of Susan McAdam has been working for a long time to get recognition of the fact that there is a curve on the uh, the uh, bridge over the uh, San Joaquin River that has both uh, horizontal and vertical uh, changes at the same time. And she has determined that that is uh, a danger to uh, derailing trains going over it. And she has recently had an a finding from the uh, California Public Utilities Commission that that is in fact a danger. Uh, do we or do we not want to put that in our letter? Is this, this the same gal that addressed us maybe three or four years ago, Paul? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. She does it, not give us faces. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's not directly discussed about in the business plan, but um, it is an area of concern. So I'm not sure if it's because this is a comment letter on the business plan itself, rather than specific problems uh, in parts of the project itself. Well, that certainly is valid. I mean, we could, I mean, Robert, what other types of um, uh, ways our committee could get a feedback to uh, the high speed rail uh, high speed rail group in terms of this type of concern is it um i think that there are a number of ways number of ways to do it the concern that i would would have is that segment is not really part of something that affects the town specifically um, but I do understand and appreciate that if it is a safety issue, it should be brought to light, which I'm sure um, uh, Ms. McAdams is doing, but there is uh, there are other avenues. One would be we typically invite high speed rail to come and talk to us at least once a year. We can invite them and it can be brought up in that avenue. Um, committee members as individuals are more than welcome to send uh, letters and other comments to the High Speed Rail Committee uh, or make public comment at their, um, at their meetings. Um, we can table this as a discussion item for the committee at a future date if you'd like to talk further about how that can be done or offline, um, as long as it's not a quorum. You know, um, I'm happy to talk with any member of the committee about, you know, other avenues and certainly open other suggestions by members of the committee as how things can be, can be raised. But I, I think that the, um, as, as the chair indicated, this letter is probably more, it needs to be more directed to responding to the document as presented. Yeah. Fine. Okay. So, Paul, yeah, if, just follow up with me and Robert in terms of um, the resolution you, you think is, is you would like to see from this. And we'll. I, I think that action is appropriate. And I think okay. uh, Robert's comments are entirely fitting. Okay. So, let's just drop it. Okay. For now. Yeah. Yeah. Just let us know uh, if you think of a, a way we, if we as a committee should act on it and then we'll, we'll agendize yeah, it for a future. We, we can take it up later. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Okay. It's not going to go away. No, I'm sure <laughs> we've got, we've got years to. Uh... <laughs> well, just out of curiosity, I know it's not part of it, but is, is that structure built? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, maybe then we don't have years. <laughs> well, the first thing they do, first thing they plan to do is run conventional trains down it. Uh, <laughs> so that might be very interesting. Okay, so um, okay. yeah, let's uh, stay on the uh, letter. Is there anything else in the last page? 
Well, I, I, again, I want to leave that last paragraph. So if there's nothing preceding okay. that last paragraph. I don't know that it's exactly this last page, but it seems to me that there's a point we, we could have made that we didn't. And I'm, I'm not sure I got my facts straight, but let me try. I think their projections of funding and ridership are inherently contradictory because to get the ridership they project by the year they think they'll get it, they've got to have a system up and running. And their projected funding to do that doesn't come close to those years. Now, it seems to me they can't have it both ways. <laughs> Do you have any way to demonstrate that mathematically or just to point out that contradiction or? Well, I mean, they say that by 2030, I'm making this up because I don't have the, the plan open in front of me. But as I recall, they were saying by 2031, they were going to have, you know, that they had in hand or projects of, you know, less than half of the funding. And yet by 2033, they were going to have millions of people writing this thing. I don't see, I don't see how you can do one if you can't do the other. On the other hand, you know, I don't know, maybe it takes too long to, to put that all up and, and whether they pay any attention to it or not, I don't know. But uh, just, well, I think we'll, if I were a thesis exam, I would challenge them on that. Do we? Does the committee want um, maybe John and Robert to put something together on that, and then because uh, this this will probably be our last chance to review it as a committee, and we could direct um, some action and adding some text on that if, if that's of interest to the committee or we could not have it. That's kind of our two options, I suppose, at this stage. I, I think that's a good idea to have uh, John and Robert make some changes there to suit them. Okay. Okay, Robert, I will go dig out the numbers that I'm referring to and the, the, the citation and the plan where they come. Okay. Send it to you, and then you, you do what you want with it. If you think it's an important thing to include in the letter, fine. If you don't, that's also fine. Well, what would be helpful? Uh, we can talk offline, John, as to how to put it in. Um, and so I, I will note that I did have this one statement here about their current funding projections being uh, about $25 billion through 2030, which is less, I think, leading into what you're saying, John, less than 25% of what their, well, that's the overall capital cost, not the usable segment cost. And so I think what they're looking at is a usable segment. And I'm not quite sure whether or not the 25 million, 25 billion is sufficient to get them to that first usable segment. But um, happy to talk with you offline. And okay, well, maybe, maybe I misunderstood their ridership projections. I thought those ridership projections were talking about the full project. Uh, they got there. Their first riders are um, within the valley. Okay. Well, I'll go back and look, and if I think it's still worth talking about, I'll we can get together. If it's not, if I've just sort of misread their ridership projections, then fine, we're done. Okay. Um, so, John, why don't you go ahead and discuss the last paragraph and your suggestion on kind of cleaning it up a little bit? Well, okay. It was really just the last sentence of the last paragraph, the one that starts four lines down saying, we urge the development of a full funding and implementation plan. And I, that's fine, but it, it goes on for four more lines. And it seems to me it's kind of a rambly sentence. And I think a concluding sentence of a letter like this ought to have some punch to it. And so I'm not suggesting any change in the content particularly. I guess what I was suggesting was 
let's let's take what we got. We re urge we urge the development of a full funding and implementation plan that is more realistic. Period. Period. I totally agree with that, John. That's a that's a de declarative end of the thing and sums up our point. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I was I was going to. Maybe we maybe that's a good point, Jim. That we should just end it there. The rest of it we don't need, as you said. It's a long rambling sentence and stuff. Let's just end with something that's definitive. We don't want this. Period. And the state. break it down in separate separate sentences to shorten leave, up the sentences. Leave the last last uh, half out. Just stop it. Realistic. Period. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Who wrote it? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you want to defend it? No. Um, like I said, I mean, I took input from the committee as, as it came, and I tried to put it in a format that would, um, you know, would be suitable for review by the committee as a, as a draft letter. And ultimately, our intent is to get this before the council so that they can act uh, to send it out. Um, as, as you are doing, they may or may not wordsmith it or delegate it down to, you know, to address any comments that they may have. Um, but uh, I'm happy to end the letter at, at realistic. That's perfect as far as I'm concerned. Sounds good. Okay. So just to close this out, um, can I get a motion or a chair through, through the chair, if we can get a motion that um, I guess delegates the incorporation of the comments received today with any additional feedback from the vice chair for inclusion in the final letter to be submitted to council um that should uh, i think we'll get us there with a recommendation taken to council at their april 6 meeting would anyone so, like to put forward that motion so moved. moved second do i hear a second this is jim i'll second it okay okay so okay. was that paul or jim that made the motion well it was, it was me but i think paul and i both spoke at the same time so pick one you like oh yeah, take them. All right. Okay. Paul is motion and Jim Jans. Do we need to do individual votes or uh, can we, do we just say all in favor? I type of. Well, I can run through real quick. Sure. Uh, okay. Roll call. Okay. Yeah. Chair Key. Aye. Vice Chair Malbeck. Aye. Uh, Member Jones. Aye. Member Massey. Aye. Member Jans. Aye. Member Conlon. Abstain. I didn't hear participate on the changes. Okay. Member Ringham. Reluctantly, I I think the whole thing is a joke. The I, whole I don't, idea. It's I think based you, on the premise that this is going to happen. I think everything that we've read and heard and in comparisons to other lines around the world, the chances of this being a success or even being completed are very remote. And I think somebody, instead of acting as though we're going along with the fact that they're doing this, should raise some questions about its feasibility. And I'll remind you of the mission statement of the High Speed Rail Authority. It says, initiate construction of high speed rail system capable of sustained speeds of 200 miles per hour or greater. There's nothing in their mission that asks them to ask them, ask them to give the, evaluate the feasibility of anything. This first compromise they made was just saying, okay, we'll make it just in the Central Valley. Okay, thank you, Jack. Um, so let's move on to our next item. Okay, so I'll share Sorry. the screen again. 
the 5B, is it 5B, the station uh, remodel update? That's correct. Um, yes. So thank you, Chair. Um, last night at uh, the city council meeting, um, the city council authorized um, staff, uh, authorized city manager to enter in, into an agreement with uh, Garavaglia Architecture Inc. for the design of the rail station remodel. Uh, so with that, we will um, be working to get that agreement in place and get started on, on the design. There is a subcommittee that has been assigned to assist staff in um, managing the project and, and in meeting the council's goals with regards to the, to the station building. And so um, with that, um, available to answer any questions. I, I'd like to make a comment. I had heard uh, that there's a possibility of putting the history room in the new remodeled station. And I would absolutely caution against that. I think it would be vandalized and destroyed over a short period of time. And I believe the history room, if put together, belongs in the, uh, the Civic Center and not in the train station. I hope I was just hearing a rumor, but I would strongly advise against that. Yeah, uh, the Heritage Room is located in the Historic Council Chambers. And Good. so that's where the majority okay. of that's going to be located. Thank you, Thank you Robert. Uh, how, how long is the design going to take? Uh, the goal would be to be able to get it out for construction next construction season. So next uh, spring, summer be out. Okay. Robert, I, that I was listening to part of the council meeting last night and then I had to drop off for something, but there was some discussion going on about whether this current contract was going to result in construction drawings that could be put out for bid or whether it was going to be sort of a conceptual design that would then require a more detailed design for construction. Did that get resolved? Yeah, this contract is for full design, full design documents to go out to bid. Okay. It good. includes getting the necessary build, you know, submitting, getting the building permits uh, for the work as well. Okay. All right. That's, that's much better. <laughs> is it the intent of this design to design what could be a functioning station, or is it to design a museum piece? The intent of the design so, is to integrate the building to the town center um, and potentially use it as a, a rail history museum or a museum of rail history in the town of Atherton. Um, accounting for potential audio visual displays and other displays within the area. And the primary things are going to be number one, uh, taking care of a lot of the deferred maintenance of the structure um, and, and doing those kinds of repairs, reorienting the opening so that rather than being closed to the town center um, and open now to what is the uh, the fenced off rail corridor is to reorient the opening towards the town center so that it is more, um, more cohesive um, and, uh, and sealing off the back, rehabilitating the, um, again, the structure and outfitting it for, um, for displays. Uh, some minor landscaping right around the structure where we have the kiosk sign and um, some of the uh, smaller planter beds uh, that were not done as part of the town center project. The item that was a potential additional item that the council elected not to include at this time is additional landscape screening. Um, I'll call it uh, towards Watkins Avenue um, along um, the rail corridor. So. Uh, that screening is something that is potentially left to a future date. This is Jim again. I want to go back yeah. on the history thing. You just yeah. mentioned History Rail Museum, and earlier we had, you said well, the history was going to be an heritage room. I, I believe we should not put any his, history historical things in this thing because I would fear it would be vandalized and destroyed. So which is it? So nope. the town history stuff associated with uh, the heritage group is going to be in the heritage room at the old 
town center at the okay. old building. Uh, the council has uh, has a desire to have a public space that showcases rail and there is the potential for that to be incorporated into this building, but that's at the direction of the council. Well, once again, I would urge against putting anything of any value in there historically, given the current situation with smash and grab, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, that's all I gotta say that. I'll drop the issue. Paul, you had a comment or question? No, I just question, could we know who's on the subcommittee working with the architect? Rick uh, and Diane, Paul. Rick and Diane, okay, thank you. Uh, Robert, has anybody ever considered including in the Caltrain station that clock that's out there that uh, Bob, whatever his name was, put up several years ago, decades ago? Well, now that we have ownership of the site, we are, um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's been some conversations with, uh, with Sandy about uh, potentially taking over that, that maintenance. I think that there's uh, either an annual maintenance or other check that needs to happen. I haven't looked at the clockworks myself yet. And I think we'll be doing that soon. You know, I had a brief conversation with Sandy about it not too long ago, and I'm having dinner with him tonight. So maybe I'll bug him about it again, because I think the clock works fine on one half and not on the other half. Yeah, we might need to maintain it. And I'm going to say that I, it, it may be that there's a particular clocksmith that might need to come out and take a look at it, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, okay. I'll... Uh... I asked that the clock guy that's got a, a shop down by the post office in Menlo Park, and he said he was too old to climb ladders, so that didn't go very far. <laughs> okay. Is, is that Sandy Critton that you guys are talking about? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, any other comments? I just have a question. What does Sandy Critton then have to do with all this? He knows how to fix clocks, supposedly. <laughs> I see. Okay. I don't know. As I say, I'm supposed to have a St. Patrick's Day dinner with a bunch of people, including Sandy tonight, and I will see where he stands on it. Any other comments or questions on this item before we move on? Seeing none, move on to 5C Watkins Avenue Safety Improvements and Quiet Zone Extension. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is a, a brief uh, status update. Uh, the design of the Watkins Avenue safety improvements have uh, gone past the 65% stage. Town, provide, town staff provided comments to Caltrain and uh, their consultant. Uh, they've all, the Caltrain, Caltrain and the consultant have also received comments from the CPUC on the safety improvements. And there's a meeting scheduled for tomorrow to review those comments with uh, between the consultant and the CPUC so they can move forward with uh, getting it to 95%. Uh, the goal has been to get the design done uh, by sometime in June so that it can go through its uh, regulatory review process and go out to bid with the intent of construction beginning in January. And so things seem to be appropriately on track. Um, also, I do want to indicate that um, the town has sent out its notice of intent letter to extend the Atherton Fair Oaks quiet zone to uh, include the um, Watkins Avenue crossing that was mailed out um, and dated February 18th. Um, and so there's a 60 day comment period uh, associated with that. So we are just now closing up on the first month. Um, and so that, any comments so far? Uh, not that I have seen, okay. but it's not uncommon for those things to come at the last minute. Okay. But there, I mean, should we be making some comments? Are you opposed to the quiet zone? Oh, you're, it's only if you're opposed to it. Okay. No, well, the, the letter is directed to 
the regulatory authorities here. I, hopefully I'm pulling it up. Um, the regulatory authorities and the um, and the, the folks that operate in the corridor. So this letter is officially sent to the FRA and um, copied on it are additional, um, so you have the FRA, you have um, the CPUC, you have the Joint Powers Board, Union Pacific, uh, Railroad Safety Branch of the Department of Transportation and the police chief. So those are the folks that are um, officially noticed with the letter. And so um, I'm going to say- Does good the letter morning. ask for anything? Does it ask for approval by anybody? We don't need approval. Oh, okay. All right, then my question is forget it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so and I'm going to say that I would say we're not anticipating, hopefully not anticipating any comments from the CPUC and the FRA. They're involved in the review of the design and the improvements at Watkins. And uh, if they have any requirements for um, any uh, safety features, we're hoping that they provide those direct comments through the design process so that they are incorporated with the safety improvements. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is, any there other? Any of, is there any way of structuring this so that it can cover the entire right of way within Atherton's borders and lend itself perhaps to be extended by Menlo Park without leaving a gap? Um, I, I, I believe that it is structured to be able to do that because as I mean, we only have two crossings and the sounding requirement, as I recall, is a quarter mile in advance of a crossing. Yeah. So yeah. Menlo Park could extend it. They would have to uh, quad, quad gate um, all their crossings so that they could have a continuous quiet zone as well, added on to our quiet zone if they wanted. So if so, they had a quiet zone for uh, Enso, it would, it would stretch into uh, ours. Yes, um, although it's a little bit of a gray area because Encinal is within a quarter mile of the next, is it Oak Grove? Um, because it's so close, I th I'd probably have to ask Narissa <laughs> in terms of uh, what, how, how would they actually, how, how you would define where the quiet zone begins and ends. Uh, because each of the Menlo Park uh, rail crossings are so close to each other, I think they actually have to be all, um, all quad gated for them to be a continuous quiet zone. Well, I'm, I'm sure that's true. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, Jim, did you have a question? Jim Jans? I th I thought you saw you. Yeah, a related issue. I was just curious, uh, Bob, uh, have you received, uh, well, I have noticed that there has been there have been more soundings of the horn uh, of late in the last few days, week or so, uh, particularly early in the morning. I'm just curious whether you've heard any complaints from anybody or if anyone else has noticed this. John, perhaps you have. There's a couple of trains that come usually northbound at around six o'clock in the morning that have been blowing their horns ever since the quiet zone started. I mean, oh. A couple of rogue engineers that don't like us, or I don't know what they don't like. But. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I'm not quite clear on, I'm going to say that we have to keep in mind that there are workers that are working within the rail corridor, and I don't know what hours that they're out there, but they um, they are sounding their horns and are going to continue sounding their horns when there's any potential um, risk on the corridor. I think uh, we can talk in the next topic about the recent things that happened with Caltrain. 
Okay. Yes. That's fair. There are people out there. Um, any other questions or comments on this item? If not, let's move. On. Oh, I go just ahead. want to answer, yeah. answer John. Said it, it was Bob. Going back to the last time, it was Bob Simons. So yeah, yeah Bob, that's, that's the yeah, that, that's right. uh, like Bob Simons. That they built that clock. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to the next item. And that's uh, the 5D Caltrain update. Yeah, so I'll keep this brief. Um, so it, uh, Caltrain has approved their governance reform plan. Um, I think we're all noticed on that. And I think there's been an agreement on uh, the money and where it's coming from to reimburse Samtrans. And I believe that also includes the... Um, the interest whether you call it interest or other value add based on the, the right of way. Uh, so they are gonna be continuing to work on any sort of formal agreements and get that set out. Uh, Caltrain is seeking additional funding to cover the, the cost gaps on their uh, most recent global settlement with Balfour Beatty um, to help them close that and finish off, um, finish off the project. Uh, they were continuing to work on um, installing facilities. They had uh, they have some signal work that's going on right now, I believe, in San Mateo and Burlingame, and they have uh, adjusted their schedule to accommodate that work, um, including, I believe, some single tracking potentially um, in that area. Um, and so that that's ongoing. And then unfortunately there was uh, an accident in San Bruno in which the train hit um, uh, a vehicle uh, that was hanging, I don't know if it was hanging over the track, but um, in San Bruno, there was uh, an unfortunate incident uh, between uh, the train and a contractor vehicle. And there were a few folks that were injured. Um, and so, um, the NTSB, I believe, is doing their investigation. Um, our um, thoughts are with uh, those folks that were injured, both, um, you know, the construction workers, Caltrain, folks of the Caltrain family, as well as uh, others that were on the train at the time. I have a few more things to add on the Caltrain updates. The uh, Caltrain board uh, did approve the agreement uh, but uh, it still has to be approved by each of the individual agencies in the county. So um, Sam Trans, VTA, and the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. So um, the Sam Trans discussion will be interesting whether they, they choose to accept the uh, agreement with the uh, extra interest payments or, or they want to, or any other differences with the proposal. Because uh, it's not just the money, there's also the uh, change of control that. Uh, that the Caldrain board is asking for as well. Um, in terms of the accident that occurred in, um, uh, that happened, uh, the interesting thing was that, um, you know, positive train control was, a, you know, supposed to you know, stop these types of accidents and the train, the train, the Cal Caltrain has had PTC in operations um, since, uh, well, they started in 2019 and, it's been fully certified since 2020. And it crashed into the a Balfour Beatty work train. Um, so either something went wrong with the positive train control system or the work train um, was using some other process and bypassed it and um, you know, something in the safety protocol was, was missed of some sort. So uh, the NTSB is gonna put out a preliminary report um, sometime in the beginning of April. So we'll know at least their initial findings because they have a, a, a data recorder from the train to kind of see what uh, what it recorded and um, what was going on. But the, the full report will probably take a year for it to, to be completed. Uh, are there any comments or questions on this item? Is there any reason to be concerned about the... Uh the operation not working? Well, I, um, I think we'll find out from the preliminary report and the full report from the NTSB. They're a pretty good agency in terms of 
putting out all the facts out there. So uh, we'll have to wait and see from the report what, exactly what they find. Well, I don't know if it's our responsibility, but it seems to me they should change their process to protect the crews that are working on the track while they while they find out why the train ran through it. I mean, it seems to me they could do things manually in the interim before they get the report to protect the crews that are working on the track. But I don't know if that's our jurisdiction. Yeah, it's important, but I'm not sure what we could uh, what we can exactly do to tell them to, I mean, their safety protocols, they're supposed to be put in place. If, if they need to improve it, then we could recommend something, but I don't think we know enough about rail safety protocols to, I, cause we, we can't, we don't have a concrete recommendation to make to them. That's, that's I, kind I, of. I think that they're gonna, they are, they, they are working to make sure that, yeah. that this doesn't, that this doesn't occur again. I think that they, they, in terms of the statements that, uh, the limited statements that they are allowed to provide, uh, this is incident has, has really had an impact on Caltrain and their, um, and their staff. And so it's something that's at the forefront of their, their, their minds. Yeah. Well, I would think they had a procedure before they had the train control and whatever they did before to protect the crews that they should go back to that, what, whatever it was, if they had any. But I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. Well, let's I don't go know so. what the time frame is for their electrification project, but technological advances in battery-powered trains are moving ahead pretty fast. And it may be that by the time this electrification is finished and the wires are up, that they'll have battery-driven trains. They won't need the wires. Are there any other comments or questions? Well, Go ahead, yeah, Paul. this positive train control has gone way back to the CBOS system that they tried to develop themselves. And the, the whole thing has been shrouded in a, a lot of uh, misconception and uh, poorly stated positions and some bad analysis. I think it's most unfortunate this happened, but I don't see that it could be a surprise based on the history of the of the work. Okay. Any other uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, why don't we move to 5e, the grade separation discussion? Okay, so this item was put on the agenda um, at the request of uh, the chair and Mr. Conlon to talk about great separations, uh, activities, studies, and other things that are happening along the corridor. Um, and so I think there was some previous discussion about some studies that were ongoing in other jurisdictions with regards to elevating or lowering um, the uh, the train um, in various jurisdictions. Uh, this is just here as an opportunity for the committee to discuss. As you all know, there's currently no proposal to um, do grade separation within the town. You want me to comment? Greg, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think uh, my concern is in the traffic congestion that will occur when both the high-speed rail and the Caltrain's trains are running like 20 trains an hour and that the safety issues on traffic will be very serious. And I just think that uh, Palo Alto is doing a, they're doing the, all the work to build a trench, but I don't think, I think they have another alternative also, but I'm not, not sure what it is. I tried to find it. They say it's on their website, but I couldn't find it today when I looked for it. But uh, it's probably a similar distance, about a mile. That there's, I don't know where it starts at Charleston or, or Church Avenue and goes south. 
for about a mile. And uh, I know that the county gave them $700 million for uh, great separations. And I think that that's their idea is to use that money for uh, either trenching or whatever the other option is that they're looking at. And I just think that, uh, that we should be aware that, that there is a, a, probably a significant problem of traffic control once all this gets up and running. And, you know, I can't think that, uh, you know, and I, and Malcolm Dudley, he always argued that Atherton was donating uh, $50 million a year through Prop A. And I'm not sure how he calculated it, but he got the sales tax that the Athertonians would be spending every year and, and adding that up. And I think that's where he got that number. But Prop A has been in business, what, 20 or 30 years? Uh, Jim, I don't know what your recollection is. Mine's not that good. But uh, we're talking about a lot of money. So uh, I think that uh, limitations of finances, although important, are not overwhelming. I mean, money comes out of the woodwork when there's a when there's an accident or a, a serious problem occurs on a, a congestion on traffic. But it's usually ten years later before you can do anything about it because it's so expensive. So I, I just uh, I think that the the city council should be aware of what's going to happen when it happens as far as the congestion. And if they don't do something to let the traffic flow, whether it be a trench or a, uh, I guess a, a, over, uh, a bridge or something, uh, it's gonna be a serious problem to get automobiles through town. And, and uh, John, I think you had a concern that would back all the way up from uh, to the railroad railroad tracks to the El Camino, is that right? Well, yeah. I mean, it does that now just because of the red light at El Camino. I, I wonder if we could do a little study. Maybe we could work with uh, Steve McCauley and the police department to develop some some numbers about the number of cars that go across those tracks. And if we estimate the number of trains, assuming that both Caltrain and high-speed rail do what they say they're gonna do, and I don't know how long the gates are down, but you know, I could go out there with a stopwatch and get some idea of what happens at Fair Oaks Lane and just ask the police department, you know, what are the implications of this? How many cars and if it's closed for that many minutes a day, what does it mean? And if you gather that information up and send it to the council. Did you have your hand up, Bob? Yeah, I did that study several years ago. I spent uh, mornings out at the different uh, grade crossings and looking at the traffic and looking at the downtime for the gates and figuring out what might happen in the future and published a paper on it, which was circulated somewhere. And uh, you know, that work's been done. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Um, so Bob, what was the and then and let, let, well, well, the conclusion is it'd be a terrible mess. Yeah, Bob, did you want to say something? Then I'll turn it to Robert. Oh, okay, then Robert, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna remind the committee that, um, I think this item was raised in the EIR that came through for high speed rail in this segment and it's this is one of the items that we commented on as an area of concern um, particularly not just on the on the traffic side but as well as the emergency response side and so um, this is certainly an issue that is at the um, forefront of our concerns with high-speed rail in terms of what the gate downtimes are um, and we did put it in our um, comment letter uh, to High Speed Rail on the EIR EIS when it was out for public review. We anticipate that that'll be coming um, back, um, but I think we're digressing a little bit from grade separations. But I understand that the, the relation with traffic impacts, and it is something that we are uh, going to be keenly watching in terms of how they respond back to the comments 
we're not the only ones that are going to be impacted by that. Well, I think that we, it would be beneficial to know what, Bert, what uh, Palo Alto's doing and how long it is and how much it's costing. So you get a order of magnitude of what the cost would be, because I think it's very comparable based on a brief conversation that Alex and I had with Pat Burt. Do you remember, Alex, what he said as far as the distance? Um, I, I didn't talk with Pat, uh, but the in terms of where Palo Alto is going through, their preference has been a trench or underground, just that the cost is significant. I think it was in the range of at least 500 million for one crossing and maybe a billion for doing the two crossings in South Palo Alto. It's off the top of my head, but I can't quite remember what it was. And while Palo Alto hasn't completely removed it yet, I don't believe as a possibility, it's not going, I don't think it's going to happen. It's just too much money. Um, and basically, you know, they're going to be told, if you want to have the trench, you guys got to pay for it. You know, the, the Fed, state, and a, a county are only going to give you so much. They'll give you enough to do the great separation, which would be raising the uh, raising the, uh, the the rail or and or lowering the uh, road. Uh, but they're not going to give you everything to do a trench because it's um, it's just simply too much. I, that's just my reading of what's going to happen politically. <clears throat> Well, I was at the Palo Alto meeting when they discussed with the county what they were going to do. And if they didn't give them the 700 million, they were going to vote no the next time that tax came around. So I think that they're serious about getting, and I think they got $700 million. That's it's, not a drop in the bucket. It's actually, it'll be probably one third of that 700 million because it's, uh, it's 700 or 800 million for all the rail projects in the county. And there's three cities in there, uh, Mountain View, Sunnyville, and Palo Alto that have Caltrain. Uh, and, and I think the agreement was, we want this rail money be, or we're not gonna vote for the, uh, for the sales tax when it came around. Right, right. And it's, it's money over 30 years. So, um, so the next time it's gonna come around is maybe 28, 27 years from now. Um, so no, it's, but it's they got be, the money on the last, the last one is just recent. Yeah, this was, that was the most recent one where they, they got the money. And so the money is not coming in all at once because it's a 30 year sales tax. So they're going to get paid over time. And it's kind of at what point Santa Clara will front the money to, uh, each rail project as it decides to grade separate, but uh, there's not going to be enough money, you know, 200 million. That's not enough to do a, a trench for any of those Palo Alto, uh, underground. So, and plus where's the rest of the money going to come from to uh, Palo Alto certainly can't afford for um, the, to uh, foot the rest of the bill. So that that's, that's going to be, I think they're going to have a choice where they're going to have to choose to do some kind of, uh, you know, lower the road, raise the uh, rail type of choice. And, and that that's the most cost effective one if they want to actually do the grade separation. Otherwise, they're going to be waiting forever for getting the money to tunnel. And that's also the risk that Atherton might have is that, you know, the city council can go and say, we want to do this, but no one's going to want to spend that much in Atherton uh, to pay for all of it. Um, the state well, Robert, is not going to. Robert, do you have access to their, their data? Because they've spent a lot of time and money on doing the engineering. Who's I just wonder if we could get some ballpark. I think he means numbers. Palo Alto. Um, I can try and look for it. Yeah, because I tried to find it. I couldn't find it. Pat said it was there. And I think they've, they're they hiring the, the second engineering firm because they weren't happy with the cost estimates of the first one. So they're yeah. very serious the about it. The costs only go up. Well, I know, but they just felt that, I, that, that bad enough that they're going to replace the engineer. So we'll see. I'm I'm not sure if changing the engineer is going to change the realistic cost of of the construction. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> they hired a new engineer. And I'll send out a link to it. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll Greg. I'll send you what I have to. I'll look for 
for um, some of the documents uh, that that they posted too. Um, was there any other things uh, people wanted to discuss on on this? Yes. Uh, Go ahead, Jack. One thing that we ought to recognize is that if Fair Oaks Lane is grade separated, it'll tr attract local traffic from Fifth Avenue through Atherton. Okay. Now say that. What is that point, Jack? People, uh, Jack was saying. Separated, it'll attract some of the traffic that's now using Fifth Avenue to get across the tracks, and they'll come through Atherton on local streets, like Fair Oaks Lane and Watkins. I think he's trying to say people will avoid the congestion on Fifth Avenue and come through Fair Oaks instead. Well, Fifth Avenue is grade separated now. Yes. I, th yeah. I think to avoid congestion, they're, they're going to choose other roads that, oh. that are grade separated. I go down that apparently occasionally, and there doesn't seem to be much of a traffic problem. Oh, I go down because I'm not that far away from it, Paul, and there is traffic. There's a lot oh, of traffic. Okay, I, I withdraw just, my comment. It is a problem. I avoid it as much as I can. Yeah, they turn off of El Camino to Jack on a box and head right down. You're exactly right, Jim. And it's, it gets to be a mess down there. And then you have the light at Middlefield, which even makes it worse. I avoid it, too. Yeah, I, I think what makes the, um, uh, the great separation, if you're doing a trench at, uh, at Watkins expensive, Watkins and Fair Oaks, is that we have the Atherton Channel and you have to get the rail underneath the Atherton channel. So it's gotta be pretty deep uh, to do so. And if it's pretty deep and you only have at most 2% grade, you've got to start very far back in Atherton and Menlo Park. And that's what's going to make it um, expensive. That's, that's really the biggest thing that will make it expensive because you could raise the road a bit, um, something reasonable, but the, dig, the, far, the farther down dig, you, farther you dig deep down, the more expensive it'll get for uh, this type of project. And also the construction going on, I'm sure the Atherton residents are not going to be happy that they're going to have to live through probably nightly construction for years uh, to do any type of uh, trench because they're going to have to build a bypass. And then, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I, I, I think politically that that would kill it immediately just because the people who live near the rail are going to have to deal with years of nightly construction, no matter what it, no matter, even if it was cheap, it would have trouble politically to get past the council on just on that basis. Um, oh, any other comments on this? Okay. Why don't we move on to the next item? So thank you, chair. The next item is related to litigation. Um, I think as uh, was indicated in the previous, um, the appeal has been submitted to the uh, state Supreme Court for uh, consideration. Um, last I checked, I think that they provided an extension, uh, Jim. Let me Jim? give you the update. The update is as of today, just a few hours ago. It's not good news. Um, we were alerted that they extended the time period uh, for the appeal and comments. They submitted additional comments from, uh, from the other side, from, high, from the rail authority uh, and from us, uh, uh, from our attorney. And we did that, gave us a lot of hope that they were gonna take it under consideration. I'm reading from the email this morning, very succinct, petition for review denied. California Supreme Court. Uh, Stu Flashman's comment was FYI, oh well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. That's it. That's it. That, that lawsuit is over. I mean, I suppose, you know, I'll ask, we'll, we'll ask Stu uh, if he can reapply and come look at it again, and, and maybe he can, maybe he can't, but I don't hold out any hope for it. Yeah, sounds good. It's dead. 
Okay. Um, any questions or comments on this item? Well, it's been a good fight, but uh, yeah. it didn't work. Yeah. yeah. And Stu has been very good at keeping this thing up and moving, but you can only do so much. I think we owe him a vote of thanks for all the effort he's put into it. We ought to take him out for a really nice dinner. Well, he's been paid for some of this, you realize. Not a whole lot. Maybe not such a lot. He'd be paid a lot more if we'd <laughs> had any success. Um, well, and Mike Brady's done it for free. Right. Well, and, and Stu gave us the pro bono rate. So uh, Community Coalition on High Speed Rail funded the appeal, um, which was a bunch. It was $3,000. Um, but that's where we are. Um, it's, it's, I'll tell you the say, here's the big risk. Our, the point of the lawsuit, uh, at least by the time it got to the, to the, the specific appeal to the Supreme Court, was that, look, you can't pull a bait and switch on a bond measure. You can't say you're going to do A and do eh, B or B plus or something like that. You've, you've got to do what you said you're going to do. Their reaction, at least from their filed papers, was sort of like, hey, this is a real big project. So you don't have to be as specific on a huge project as you do if you were just building, let's say, one grade separation or something like that. And... Um, the Supreme Court apparently bought that argument. The problem is, and it may not happen, but I, you see, the problem is, and we were we were hoping we could get some somebody from the bond industry to, to weigh in and, and encourage the Supreme Court to take the case. But but the, the potential problem is that a bond issue comes along in the future and people realize, so, well, hey, I can vote for this but they may actually not do it. They may just take this money and do something similar with it, but not what I voted for. And therefore, not approve it. So, um, you know, the, the actions of the California Supreme Court and the actions of the state of California on this whole, this whole proposition uh, are, are risky. And, you know, it's, it's not without risk for the state. And we'll have to see what happens. Okay. Why don't we move on to the next item? Thank you, Jim. Uh, item six, committee and staff member comments. Uh, go ahead, Robert. Uh, I do have one uh, piece of information for the committee that uh, you may find uh, interesting. Uh, last night at the council meeting, as the council was uh, approving the continuing resolution with regards to emergency, there was conversation about um, transitioning to hybrid meetings. And so I believe at the next council meeting, the council will actually be meeting in the council chambers um, and it will be done in a hybrid fashion. The council chambers is uh, nearing completion and um, our city clerk has been turning on uh, the audio and video capabilities of the system. Uh, staff has not, the rest of us have not been trained yet on that, um, but there is a, uh, a good chance not, uh, I think item nine will decide whether or not we need to go, but um, aside from that, uh, the following meeting uh, will likely be, we will be able to uh, have a hybrid meeting in the council chambers. Oh, that'd be great. So sure. you're telling me if we have our meeting in April, we could be the first group to have oh. a meeting in the council chambers. The council meets following that. So the council is always first. So we're not allowed on the day before, <laughs> but they're okay. Well, that's the benefit of being on the council, I guess. <laughs> I don't. I don't think look, the look at it this way. All the bugs will get worked out. Hopefully, before we get in there. Well, maybe we <laughs> should go to make sure the bugs get worked out. <laughs> Not a chance. 
<laughs> so um, that's the piece. I know that the, the committee has been itching to be able to meet in person. And so the good news is, is that as, as we move forward, we have a, a, a good likelihood that we'll be able to do so soon. So yeah, it'll be good to see everyone in person again. Yeah. Yeah. Is um, okay. Our, so I, I think our plan is to cancel the meeting in April uh, since there won't be that much change in the next two and a half weeks, um, unless, does anyone think we need to have a meeting in, in April? Okay, then we'll uh, we'll meet two and a half months from now. Then, yeah, right uh, next regular meeting then will be in June. In June, yeah. Uh, any other member comments? If not, let's move on to the next item. No, any no public comment? Any agenda items for the future that anyone wants to suggest? Well, I still want to look at this uh, thing that Palo Alto is doing because they're spending a lot of money and they've spent a lot of money. And I think it'd be foolish for us not to take advantage of what they're doing because the distance is about the same. That's the only point. And I don't know whether I should do this or the staff, but somebody should figure out what they're doing and how much it costs and what, and what their plans are. I can, Greg, I can send you uh, what the, the, uh documents I have from what Palo Alto has studied, because I've, I've looked at it a bit. I can't quite remember uh, what it's calculated, but they, they've done some calculations, some preliminary engineering, uh, and I think they're going to do an additional further engineering study. To, I'm not sure if it'll get cost, but more, more engineering just to figure out what challenges there might be in doing undergrounding or, or trenching. But yeah. Um, we can, sure, if you'd like, we can coordinate offline, then I can distribute. Sure. Yeah. sure. No problem. Um, and then based on that, we can decide if we want to have a, a, a discussion based on that. Uh, those yeah, items. Just remember guys, when I was on the transportation commission of the state, we built a 20 mile trench for a billion and a half dollars. You can't do it anymore, Greg. <laughs> well, you never know. What, what year was that? <laughs> Well, it's been a couple of years. <laughs> Only a couple? <laughs> at 7% at inflation? <laughs> uh, you guys are a bunch of negative guys. You got to have a positive attitude. Hey, we're on the rail <laughs> committee. <laughs> Money comes from the sky. You just got to hold your hands on it. It'll come. <laughs> um, okay. And no, are there any other agenda items uh, anyone want to suggest? If not, uh, next meeting is going to be in June and motion to adjourn. Anyone? Wait a minute. So moved. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Go, go ahead, Greg. The election is June 7th. So I, uh, I suggest we move it a week cause I'm running for statewide office as the state insurance commissioner. Oh, okay. So okay. I prefer that we meet the following Tuesday, the 14th. Yeah. So unless somebody else has a conflict. Um, I was actually, I was thinking of moving into the 31st, but that's right after Memorial Day might not be good. So yeah, the 14th might be better. Does anyone, uh, anyone object to the 14th as, uh, as a conflict? Uh, okay. Day, that'll be great. <laughs> so uh, it, guys. on the 14th, we will celebrate Greg's win in the top two of insurance commissioner. Is that, it's the primary, right? That's, that's right. Okay, so we will uh, we will celebrate <laughs> Greg's win in the primary. Hey, I'll buy dinner if we win. Okay. <laughs> well, well, we'll be meeting in the council chambers, so make you sure to get vote, it delivered. Right. <laughs> All right, don't forget to vote, guys, June the seventh. Oh, absolutely. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. A second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, see you guys June 14th. Great. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Patrick's Thanks, Alex. Nice job. Thanks.